It's time for MacBreak Weekly. Renee, Alex, and Andy are here. We'll talk about the Beats rumor. Is it even true? And we'll answer your questions using the question engine, plus a new way to break into Apple stores. It's all coming up next. MacBreak Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is MacBreak Weekly, episode 402, recorded May 13th, 2014. Beats me. MacBreak Weekly is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audible.com slash MacBreak. And by LegalZoom. Visit LegalZoom.com to save on your legal needs and gain access to a network of legal plan attorneys for guidance. LegalZoom's not a law firm, but provides self-help services at your specific direction. Visit LegalZoom.com and use the offer code MBW to get $10 off at checkout. And by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two-week trial and 10% off, visit squarespace.com and use the offer code MACBREAK. It's time for MACBREAK Weekly, the show where we cover the Apple news in obsessive detail. And since sometimes there's very little news, sometimes we're even more obsessive. But Andy Anako says it's going to be okay from the Celestial Waste of Bandwidth and the Chicago Sun-Times. There he is holding his Simpsons phone. <laughs> what is that from? That's from uh, Sunday's episode of The Simpsons where you get to see what apps the Homer has launched on his iPhone or whatever they call it. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like grand... Well, you got your you got your worms with friends. You've got your eye runes. You've got your splintrest. You got your whimper. Grand Theft Walrus, Instagram, Snubhub, Twitter, Call of Daddy, and the app he actually launched, which is Duff Countdown, which is the countdown until you will be absolutely drunk and you're not supposed to show your wife that one. That's awesome. That's a great screen grab. I love it. Is is there an entire department at The Simpsons that's only that's only there to write gags for people who have the ability to freeze frame absolute high definition video? Because you're not going to get these jokes. <laughs> uh, you're right. Jokes. I mean, but but that, but you know that's they call that uh, in a in a real life show they call that the uh, the uh, playback live playback. And those are the guys who are doing the computers. The reason I know that is because one of them is a fan of ours, and as I mentioned, snuck a Twit tab into the browser on uh, Silicon Valley. He's now told me that the, that w one of the screens in the newsroom, the HBO show The Newsroom, will feature a Twit screen sometime in the near future. So yeah. that's an important job, those guys who make up the fake screens. <laughs> he had to get you a are the unsung heroes of our industry. Thank you for giving us free free exposure <laughs> and the reminder that there we actually do have some sort of an audience somewhere in this world <laughs> that could be applied into television. There's some Some value somewhere. Also here with us from Washington, D.C., at the White House, it's Alex Lindsay. <laughs> hey, how's it going? <laughs> Reporting live from... We're here, Leo, <laughs> to talk about uh, the FCC. Yes. Uh, we decided to cover this directly and uh, get right to, the, uh, right to the point. Very nice. Yeah. It's good we have yeah, you know. Mr. 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 Lindsay goes to Washington, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, exactly, exactly. It, it's, a good, it's a good picture anyway. It's, uh, I love it. I, be, I, be I love it. We're working our way slowly up the East Coast from Boston to Washington. Oh, no, that's the other way around. From Washington to Boston and now to Montreal. Dag Nabbit. It's uh, Mr. Rene Ritchie. We're I'm more dot com. Leo. Huh? Yeah. This is, uh, you're in the Bermuda Triangle. Absolutely. You know what else is in the Bermuda Triangle? Uh, we thought today would be the day that uh, the big announcement that Apple was acquiring Beats for $3.2 billion dollars they said that around tuesday maybe tomorrow uh i'm on record saying it's bogus it's it's a bogus rumor that these sources are jimmy iovine and dr dre <laughs> uh but i don't know if it okay let's i mean obviously that's the biggest story to talk about uh you've got your ear to the railroad you know tracks. leo we actually have it on tape let's see it oh crap it was a rumor created by Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine in an attempt to sell headphones and stock or whatever 
and to drum up, gin up some interest in a company that is actually failing. Failing. Thank you to our editors. Way too far? Yeah, way too far. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm on record. Some editors from Fox News or something? Because that was that's a well, that was a well turned bit of promotion. We're gonna save that, and then when they actually announce it. We're going to play that so I can be completely humiliated. Or John Stewart can play it. Yeah, right. Exactly. What do you think, Renee? Uh, I mean, it's it's an interesting rumor. It's not one that we... There, there was an April Fool's Day joke about this not too long ago, um, which immediately made everyone think they were reporting the April Fool's Day joke. But it's interesting because there's several areas of technology that Apple is good at but is having trouble in a securing because they're Apple, for example, streaming rights. And there's a rumor that Beats is the only company in streaming audio right now that has transferable rights. Uh, and if that's true, then maybe that'll help Apple. But more importantly, um, Eddie Q is one of the most busy executives at Apple. And that's saying something because all Apple executives are busy. But he has to run the iTunes store. He has to run iCloud and he has to secure all these deals. And if Jimmy Iovine can come in and maybe help uh, take that off Eddie Q's plate so that Eddie Q doesn't end up being one of those former Apple executives, then I think that might be, uh, at least to me, the most interesting read of, of where this could help Apple. That's an interesting take on it, that they want Jimmy Iovine, uh, who is a record company executive and has for long, many years, and highly uh, respected, that they want him to run iTunes, in effect. Yeah, or at least do the music deal so Eddie can focus on the TV and movie deals and not have to do everything all at once. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm looking at an article from Apple Insider in, uh, well, it just came out, but they reported in March, Beats Music had 110,000 subscribers. Fairly pathetic. It's around 200,000 now, but just as pathetic. I, guess I, I don't think that what Beats Music has right now means anything if Apple takes over. I mean, Apple has 450 million credit cards. You know, yeah, what so do I they need that, this for? And they've got well, they iTunes need, Radio. I, I think that they have had <laughs> trouble getting a this specific type of subscription service because, and if the, if it's true that Beats has transferable rights, um, I think that I think the music industry has been very resistant to uh, to giving them this uh, this access because they're afraid of what will most likely happen, which is Apple will crush everybody else. I mean, if they have too many. They have a lot of opportunity there. I mean, the only the biggest problem with this acquisition, if it goes through, is antitrust. You know, the 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 amount of damage Apple could do with with this acquisition. I is, don't think there's any bad. antitrust threat at all. I think well, they're buying a the failed music subscription service. Uh, I, Beats not, Beats is not getting any traction at all. It has no reach. But yeah. But 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 but, but if you add Apple's reach to. Um, well, uh, wait a minute. If you're a record label, okay, maybe you were stupid enough to sign this deal with uh, Beats that it, that they could actually transfer the rights to another company. Well, even if you're well, going to you're going to submarine this in some way. You're going to sabotage it quick. Maybe, but I mean, if they, I, what if Apple doesn't actually absorb Beats? Then then the question is is whether they whether they actually lose the um, I mean, they may not lose the the access to that subscription service uh, if they don't if they don't make it Apple. You know, so so that's another op opportunity. What of the Apple. headphones? Is there any value to that, Andy Anako? Uh, I mean, it's it's making a billion dollars a year off of what a lot of people think are some very cheap plastic headphones that are kind of ugly that really show off the logo over the performance of the audio. Uh, I don't. It's a it's a valuable brand and too valuable to really crush. But when I as I've been spending the weekend as everybody else has thinking about if this is an actual acquisition, why would Apple be interested? I don't think they'd be interested in the headphones because of all the things that Beats has uh, in the entire package, headphones is the one thing that Apple could absolutely build themselves and do a better job of building it and probably even uh, marketing it to their existing customers. I really think this is about uh, personnel. Uh, that they want to, there's uh, segments of the cons the customer base out there that they're not reaching with their existing products and their existing strategies. Uh, it's one thing to buy a streaming music service. It's another thing to find that 10 to 12 percent of people out there who are just not into iTunes right now, or maybe not even into Apple hardware right now that you could be reaching. And to, to Renee's point, I also think it's a it's a big deal to uh, for the next step for the company. To to uh, instead of treating iTunes as it maybe originally was as a way to sell iPods and then as a way to sell iPhones, uh, and now treating it as this is a core part of our business right now. And if Apple really is becoming a more mature company as a, as a content maker, then the, the the day would definitely be coming where they they can't run that division but with a, a tech guy who understands the music industry. You now have to have a music industry guy who understands the tech business, and that's what they would be getting with Beats. So the more I look at this, the less I think that it's about 
about uh, the, the hardware market as profitable as that as that is. And it's less about the streaming market, as important as it is to get into uh, a subscription music service in the near future. I really think it is about the ability to get a core of executives that has grown up and eats, breathes, and does everything else with the with music. And they're the ones who can instinctively know how to operate and market music to the entire world, not just to fans of Apple products. That's where the $3.2 billion comes from. Again, assuming this is a real thing and assuming it actually happens. Because remember, this really is just a rumor right now. Well, and, and fundamentally, I think a lot of people in the music industry don't think that anyone in the tech industry really gets um, gets them. You know, I mean, I, I started in the music industry, and every time you go to a tech uh, party, you're like, okay, these guys are kind of cute. Like, they don't know, you know, it's like, it, it <laughs> don't feel like, you know, uh, you know, this is not nothing like what you're what you're used to, and, and nothing at the level that you're used to having it. If they want to make those deals, they have to have people like that. So I definitely agree with Andy, but yeah. I do think that there is an incredible amount of value in something that's already generating a billion dollars. Uh, as well as you know, in in hardware, and and and, um, and I think the subscription services also makes a lot of sense. I think Apple hasn't been able to make this turn, and I think they and of course I've been talking about it for years that they need to make this turn. Um, the I think one opportunity for Apple is a high quality music service. So you know, would you pay twenty dollars a month or fifteen dollars a month or whatever it is to have twenty four bit audio with your cool headset? Yeah. I, I've, a, a, I think it's a bogus rumor. I think Dr. Dre is right now secretly laughing as he listens to all of this. <laughs> and B, if it is not a, a, a phony rumor, then it is a clear sign that Apple has completely run out of ideas. No, I disagree with that. I, I think one, see, I think the diff, I had a, a problem with this rumor when it first broke on Thursday, and it didn't take me long to realize the reasons why I was having problems with it is because I grew up with Apple. I grew up understanding Apple as a maker of computers, and every time they come up with a product that is not a cool piece of hardware. At least some of me is always thinking that, of course, they're making iMovie because that helps sell Macintoshes. And of course, they're selling, uh, they're having an iTunes store because they want to sell content that makes their devices more valuable, on and on and on. But just as you sometimes have to let go of your original concept of Star Wars uh, as the way it was when you were a little kid, you have to realize that a generation now thinks of Apple as a content brand, as a consumer right. brand. And that now, the, the, that's why I keep thinking about the next step for Apple can't be just we run our business based on very, very high margins on hardware. It has to be on we are making the entire widget and now the widget includes the entertainment. And if, if you continue this line of thought beyond the ability to get t content for the iTunes store, like uh, licensing deals and not, and extended uh extended past that point where now you have a relationship with the creative community where they know that the person who heads this music division at Apple is one of them. They're a producer. They're, 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 they're recording industry executives. They're not there just to figure out how can we make this into a, how can we make your, your new album or your new track into a way to market our new commercials or our, our new hardware? How can we make as much money for you as possible? And if they can turn the iTunes store into uh, a destination label that people want to actually uh, artists want to work with that could be a, a, a real turn of, of events that uh, Amazon can't deal with and that Google Play can't deal with. So there are a lot of really op real opportunities here that goes beyond what I again what I consider to be tacky big plastic headphones with way too much bass. There's something to be said too that when we spoke about this earlier that the iPhone is the single biggest business at Apple and it's going to be the biggest business for a long time and no one's Apple's not going to be able to sell enough iWatches at a high enough price to even come close to that the same thing with the iPod sorry with the iPad with the Mac and there's no other product coming along the pipeline that looks like it could be an iPhone sized business so Apple if they want to maintain growth if that's important to them because it's certainly important to shareholders and to the industry is going to have to look at other ways of making that money and absent a big thing it's going to be a bunch of little things yeah. and iTunes is already has the potential to be I mean they're it's contributing more and more to Apple's bottom line and as silly as it is but is it music or is it video and uh, tv i mean isn't it's, it's all of that it's the, the music is certainly important because the it, downloads are falling so apple needs something that will replace downloads but as silly as they are at 14 dollars headphones that sell for 200 dollars whether it's beats by apple or whether apple makes their own or whether you know they they want that brand because it appeals to different people than the apple brand that contributes towards not the Internet of Things, but the Apple of Things that can be carefully selected products that once again increase the overall value of Apple's core business. Well, and I think that also, yeah. again, if you if you look at Apple squeezing the music industry from both directions for a subscription service that could th theoretically dominate the, the subscription service process, um, as well as the ability to 
uh, possibly even curate and, uh, you know, sign their own bands directly to iTunes or directly to that subscription service with the kind of people they just brought in, um, it puts the music industry in a pretty heavy clamp if Apple chooses to do it. And once you're done, if it was me, once I finished with the music industry, I would focus on film and TV. You know, you know, it's, you know, you can do that over and over again. Well, since Katie Cotton is retiring, maybe Dre will have a job in PR. That's why she retired, Leo, so she wouldn't have to deal with this story. <laughs> That's a Dan Warren joke that I'm stealing. That's a good. It's a good. Uh, a I, good I wonder. Joke. I wonder if her replacement will get like a ceremonial, uh, a ceremonial like nicely mounted uh, version of her keyboard and instructions. Here is the here is the uh, command alt alt function button to automatically paste and reply. Apple does not comment on unreleased, unannounced products. Katie's been know. there 18 years as vice president of worldwide corporate communications. She was the name that you'd refer to when you had a quote from Apple. Um, now, I, Sam Biddle, of course, on Valleywag has the uh, the opposite take. He says goodbye to the evil queen, the queen of evil tech PR. That's disgusting. <laughs> Absolutely That's disgusting. Yeah. Uh, I thought Katie was was cl a class act in every respect. Never had a problem with Katie Cotton. Uh, that, that 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 article has absolutely no convergence with uh, okay. what I the experiences that I had over twenty years. I that was a disgusting, disgusting article, and I was deeply Good. ashamed to be read posting it. onto the same medium as that <laughs> one. That was terrible. Well, and that's why I bring it up because it wasn't my experience, and I was just curious if any of you had a any negative experience. Now, you know, one of the things he points out it was her job to uh, hide and uh, and Steve's illness. But that was her job, and I think she did it very well and, and with class. I don't think that uh, you could say in any way she was the evil queen of tech PR. Well, she created I, Apple's just, PR organization. Like yeah. they, a lot of companies have external PR. Like they'll hire, you know, Waget or some company. Right. She built a world class PR organization in Apple, and one that didn't. Uh, I mean, some people would say that they were that they were very quiet or that they were a wall instead of uh, you know an enabling force. But she built an absolutely first class press organization, and she built the culture of that inside Apple. And there's a lot of wonderful uh, senior and junior press people at Apple who are all were part of that teaching and that process or that enculturation. And that that at least is going to persist that long past Katie. Cotton's I, I, comment to uh, uh, Recode is: uh, This is hard for me. Apple's been a part of my heart and soul. Apple said, uh, the official Apple statement, she wanted to spend time with her children for some time now. We're really going to miss her. Uh, you know, 18 years is a long time to be doing what she's been doing. And uh, I think I think she deserves a break, frankly. Yeah. That, that's, every, every time that one of these uh, departures becomes big news, I wonder why there there isn't just a, a realization that a lot of these people at Apple, they don't just dip in for a couple of years, then yeah. move on to, to 3M or Xerox. They are lifers because they are part of that culture and part of that community. They like what they do. And it's a long, long chunk of your life to spend doing one thing, no matter how much you enjoy doing it. And there is there does come that, that point in which you have your monthly meeting with your accountant in which he starts off with the same question. Now, why are you still going to work because yeah. here's how much money you have yeah and, and the, also, the month and sometimes that month comes where that person does not have a good answer to that you gotta figure stock options you got 18 years ago long vested probably for 15 of those 18 years probably worth some money i mean it's, it's, it's important to understand i have friends in a lot of different tech companies and a lot some of them will tell me oh you know i made an icon last month or i you know i made a line of code last month and they'll have projects that come and go and they'll have time to take off and they'll have to, you know it's it's not a constant struggle at apple almost everybody is doing the equivalent of a marathon in bursts of sprints and that includes their pr people who are busy on sundays you know at all hours of the day and night and to do things like launch an iphone launch an ipad and it, it's exhausting it's like a forced march Boy. after forced March. And now some of them are taking the opportunity to, you know, it, it, since there is a change of the guard at Apple, they're taking the opportunity to take stock and say, okay, I'm done. I need a rest. Yep. And I've, I've known folks that, that have, you know, no longer in Apple PR and uh, in, in the level of pressure and detail is intense, you know, from everything, you know, it's just an incredible, every little bit of every little shoot of every little, you know, it's never just like, okay, that's good enough. I mean, it's the way they make their products is exactly the way they make everything else, you know, and it's, it's a, a very, very, um, you know, it can be very stressful for a lot of people. And they're chronically understaffed. I mean, we think the engineering is understaffed. Marketing and PR is incredibly small for a company Apple size. Uh, any word about who will take her place? Steve Dowling, I think it was, who was the guy who issued the statement, but probably somebody uh, from her office. I don't, 
I mean, who would you, I think Jimmy Iovine or Dr. Dre would be. <laughs> maybe the two of them together <laughs> would be would be a wonderful. I'll, I one, one thing for sure: their their call their call on hold music is going to be awesome now. Mm. Oh, <laughs> ooh. Played out of Cupertino. <laughs> when okay, so when this doesn't happen by next week, can we say it's not it was a bad rumor or uh, how long do we'll we recycle have to, it next year, Leo? How long do we? I know. I it's so obviously bogus, despite the fact that Dre put out a video on Facebook saying thanks to the sale, he's now the first rap billionaire. <laughs> a video he immediately put down, which makes me think, frankly, the whole thing came from his office. Um, well, it's. I, I agree. I mean, I, I don't know if it's real or not. Uh, we're go, we're going on such little stuff. the The only thing that makes it more interesting than most rumors is the number of high profile people who are really sticking their necks out about this. Where uh, the the financial uh, financial journals are are using language that you don't write that word and then take your hands off the keyboard and then look at that screen and not think if this does not happen then anytime I'm wrong about anything in the future, they have the right to cut and paste and say, yes, but of course, remember that Gern Blanston was the person who absolutely swore blind that Apple was buying Beats. And as we knew, Google actually picked it up only four months later for a much lower price than what was being was being tossed about. So we, we, we just don't know what's going on. Anybody, anybody in a position to really, really know is not supposed to be talking about it. And that's right. something that we should always remind ourselves. And as somebody pointed out in the chat room, Apple has not denied it. And... Uh See, I think here's what I think is happening. Yes, they're meeting with the Beats executives, uh, but it's to talk about something. Maybe bundling Beats headphones with the iPhone that would make sense. Yeah, um, but I but I, so maybe they don't want to say to uh, issue a denial right now because they're in delicate negotiations anyway. And there's and there's absolutely no reason for them to to say anything one way or another. I mean, they 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 are not they are not required to swing at every pitch. And if you think about what how do they benefit by officially denying this rumor or even saying Apple does not comment on rumors, what does that gain for them? It doesn't gain them anything. So there's no reason for them to do anything at this point. It's it's more interesting right now, as far as I'm concerned, is that it's an opportunity for pretty much everybody who professionally and semi-professionally and on an amateur basis likes to <laughs> likes to talk about Apple and what they think Apple is and what they think they should be doing. It's sort of a, a, a litmus test on what do you believe Apple is. Why do you, if if you were to if you were to think about this acquisition, on what basis would you say that this does not make sense for Apple and this does then this does make sense for Apple and that will reveal what you yourself think Apple is. Like, like I said, it it made me think about how oftentimes when I think about what I think Apple should be doing, it's because I historically think of them as a hardware company and it's hard for me to imagine them as a umbrella company that has a lot of services that are in this in the orbit of technology but not necessarily uh, in the form of uh, metal and plastic this could be just electrons that they're in the business of uh all right well what you know <laughs> you can't like, you can't, I, 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 you I can't would... prove a negative no and so we're just gonna wait and when well, it doesn't happen either, Leo. you oh? know it well, you can't prove that either, Leo, and you know it. <laughs> when, when Dre walks out on the WWDC stage, we'll know once and for all. <laughs> no, when, when Johnny Ive walks out with any Beats product on his body, then we'll you know. know that. If that ever happens, I will I've, get me a bologna have, hat so I can have, eat it. We have to make nice with the new guys. We have to make them welcome. That's why I'm wearing these hot phosphorescent diamel covered purple headphones right there that is coming a, a, off as soon as i'm off the stage I, you just can't imagine johnny ive in any way countenancing this that well okay look oh, well, if they do it it's for the streaming service which is dying but okay they'll kill the beats business or what i don't know maybe spin it off uh to get their money back because with a billion dollars a year it won't take long for them to get. remember that's revenue but i figured the profit Margin on Beats headphones is probably ninety eight percent. Yes, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that even even Apple uh, is a company that's going to say, "Well, this division is generating a billion dollars a year. Maybe we want to hold on to that because we did write a pretty big check for it." And also remember, if uh, the, the part of this that makes a lot of sense to me is when you think about uh, as a company grows, you have to start looking at 
uh, the, the the part of the world map that you don't have the little Apple logo colored in on? What what parts of the market are you not reaching? And if it's a part of the market that you've been trying really, really hard to get into, but it's defied all of your attempts, the next uh, line of thought is, okay, who is successfully marketing products to these people? And how can, and can we buy these people and just buy their expertise the I same understand way that, that Apple can buy something else? Yeah, I understand so it's, it's, that. It's interesting. It'll be, to if me, there's a press conference... Apple has always represented quality, and for them to get in bed with sleazy Hollywood music industry shills. Oh, well, uh, they, they, they did that when they opened the iTunes store. They did that when they started selling <laughs> movies. I mean, you know, and, and also, and also, as much as, as I check myself when I, when I call Beats headphones, oh, they're cheap, and they, 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 they really don't sound very good. The fact of the matter is they, they do something to sound that customers really, really like. Yeah, for they certain go. certain kinds of music, apparently, it really, it's, it's not accurate, but it's very, very pleasant. <laughs> It's the same way. The same way that like those of us who take a lot of pictures can complain about how this phone or this camera. Oh man! The only reason why people like this camera is because it's hyper saturating the colors and it's making things way too bright and it's blowing out these colors. Well, who not? Well, you know what? That's something for us to complain about. But right. people like that. People like Instagram. Like they, they like they like salt. They like sugar. They like fat. That's why McDonald's does so very very well. And the 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 store that made air air. I'm, I'm I swear to God air fried California style French fries <laughs> that opened up a, a, a couple miles away from here went out of business about three months because air frying you basically just put the potatoes out and you let them dry out in the okay <laughs> air fry it's, it's, instead of instead of dunking them in hot beef fat for for, for, for for five or ten minutes okay whatever good luck with that it's, it's also I mean if you look even in the 3.2 billion is about what a couple days a week's worth of money for Apple. And yeah, if you, and of one course. of Apple's biggest problems is how to buy companies and, and get them as, into part of Apple's culture. And with Beats, you're getting two high-profile guys who may or may not fit that model. But as a company in general, it's something that will probably either be you know just totally overwhelmed by Apple's culture or easily integrated into it. So it's it's not as disruptive as a lot of other big purchases might be. Um, well, and I think also they they definitely give Apple access to parts of the music industry and movie industry that even Steve Jobs didn't have access. to. Well, yeah, that's the question. Can Jimmy Iovine then walk in even carrying an Apple business card, can he walk in to places where Tim Cook couldn't? Probably. Right? American Idol. American Idol. <laughs> hey, but I think, did I you, think Alex, did you, you, you worked in the music industry. Did you ever deal with Iovine? I did early, very, very long ago, but only shook his hand and met him um, yeah. in, in the early 90s. Uh, so it was very I don't know if he's sleazy or not. I, my sense of him is that he is a hype master. Um, but he has produced some of the greatest albums of all time, well, I mean, including you. You is a hype master. I mean, we're talking about Apple. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, there's, you know, you know, I think that that's. Uh, I mean, Apple does make good products, but a lot of it's built on what people believe around. Right, and he's been very good uh, at marketing Beats. If all I get is yeah. HTC style speakers on the next iPhone, I'll be happy with the deal. That would yeah. be awesome. Yeah. And by the way, look how well Beats helped HTC sell the One last year. So much so that they sold off their stake. I bet now they wish they hadn't. If the rumor is true, they just threw away hundreds of millions of dollars, but that's another just matter. Can't catch a break. <laughs> can't catch a break. But it didn't help the HTC One have the Beats label on it. They got rid of it. And they, the boom sound, which is identical on the HTC second HTC One, and I don't know what the advantage of the Beats name was in that particular market. I don't think I don't think it's the Beats name. I really think that the, it's the, the people there. I think it's subscription service, and I think they're trying to... You know, I mean, I think that the, the, the headphones definitely generate revenue, so that makes it an easier pill right. to swallow. As far Although as this expense. is U.S. dollars, and most of Apple's cash is overseas, right, for tax reasons. And that could be useful for them as well. But it's not an international <laughs> purchase. If You know what, if Beats were, Beats were headquartered in Belgium, I'd say this is true, because it's almost free money. But, if it, if they're, but it's, a US, it's U.S. dollars, and that, that's cash that Apple... Is not no, quite so plentiful. We're, we're talking about the dollar amount that we don't know is genuine or not, or what right. currency would be paid right. in. So, right, It'd be paid in francs. I'm sure Iovine has a Cayman Islands, you know, hotel he could run yeah. the business out of. It's it, it's no it's it's a nice bit of serendipity that this rumor was uh, was really spreading the same weekend as the NFL draft, which is another <laughs> thing that. Everybody who's paying attention and slaving over every detail of this, they don't have any roots in that business. They don't understand the ramifications of any of these deals being made. But it's fun to talk about because that's part of your community, and maybe right. it will help you to understand the next decision a little bit better. So, Andy, are you an expert in NFL draft strategy? Uh, well, I will say that uh, I bought a very nice suit uh, to wear over the weekend just in case I got that call. That call did not come. <laughs> Uh, I also was not picked for the Eurovision Song Contest, and nobody sent me flowers for Mother's Day. So why did I bother getting out of bed this weekend? That's why I've been asking myself.
<laughs> Andrea, and we'll call you Andrea Verst. Um, I want to know how they print those t shirts. Do they know ahead of time in the draft that the guy's going to get picked by that team? Or do they just like they announce it and the guy, there's a guy in the back with one of those machines making the, the, the jersey, putting the guy's letters on the jersey so that they have it because it's so quick. Or they print every jersey in advance just in case. Oh. I, I know ESPN does a video in advance of every single potential pick going. I, w I, wondered, I wondered the same thing, too. But, and I also thought that it probably would not cost a lot of money if you were uh, in any way an NFL prospect to make sure you have one of every baseball cap standing by. <laughs> I guess so. At, at, at your house when you're waiting for that call. That's your but agent's no, I, job. I, I, I'm absolutely with you. I think about these things. And I'm just like I'm thinking about, okay, so what is – when when you win an Oscar, what is the process for actually getting your name on the thing? Oh, yeah. You actually have to they take it the back. trophy in. Yeah. Well, actually, they had. That, that's why it was. It was so cool to see at the uh, at the governor's ball. They actually had an engraving station set up ah. where you, as, every Oscar winner at the party, had to wait in line to like, here's my Oscar. See, here's here's my ticket. Here's my claim ticket. They that would engrave up the plate for you and actually stick it on it with a <laughs> special jig, because like, okay, so that's how you do it. Great, because you don't want to. That must have been an awesome out, like a, line. Wouldn't you love to be in that line? <laughs> as, uh, hey, Kevin. I, I, it's, it's, it's Meryl a line says. <laughs> It's a line of people who are not used to waiting in line no, for that's anything. Right. Cutsies. <laughs> Cutsies, Meryl. Um, oh, I go, she didn't win this year. I'm sorry, Meryl. Didn't mean to rub salt in the wound. She she won by virtue of being Meryl Streep. That's the greatest prize of all. If at hearts. the end of the day you get to be Meryl Streep, you're not going home a loser. She should have won. She actually did. Her performance uh, in, uh, was it August Osage County? I can't remember what the movie yeah. was. It was just unbelievably good. And uh, involved fisticuffs, so that's nice. Our show today brought to you by Audible.com, my friends. All I have to say is Audible.com, and then Andy will go for another minute, and then we'll end the ad. <laughs> I, we are Audible fanatics. We were talking before the show uh, about Andy's recommendation a few weeks ago, uh, a really great biography of the Beatles, and I made the mistake of, and Andy, Andy, has warned me now, so I won't make this mistake again, but I was, I'm was i three quarters of the way through Flash Boys, which is a great book too, which I, re I recommended uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I thought, well, I think it, by, it started by accident. The Beatles book, Tune In, started by accident. So I said, I'll just listen to a little bit. Four chapters later, I've completely forgotten about high-frequency <laughs> trading in the stock market, and I am living in Liverpool. I love it. Mark Lewison's amazing book, 43 Hours... And they only get to 1962, the part, the place where the Beatles are about to become famous, but are not yet. Uh, I thank you for that recommendation. So this book could be yours free, 43 hours free, if you visit audible.com slash MacBreak. Audible has 150,000 titles. All the new books come out on audible.com. They're phenomenal. Andy, what are you listening to? Uh, right now, it's uh, Creativity Incorporated, overcoming the unseen forces that stand in the way of true inspiration. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, and but 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 look look at the cover of the book. Buzz See that it is actually it. Buzz Lightyear. That it's okay. That oh, it's Buzz oh, it's Ed Cantrell. Exactly. Or, yeah, or Catmull, Ed Catmull, rather. Catmull. Yeah, oh my a, God, he's one of the, the founders of Pixar. Yeah. So this this is it's it's uh, mostly a management book, but it's also specifically here's how we manage creative people at Pixar. Uh, so if you're looking for inside stories of well, when we first tested Tom Hanks for no, you're not going to get stories like that. You're going to get stories about how how do you how do you design a building so that creative people can actually get stuff done. And even in the first couple chapters, they he's, he goes into detail over the simplest thing about how there's a conference room with a table in it and how that screwed everybody up the fact that there was a long conference room table in this building uh, in the in this room because if there's a table then there are chairs at that table if there are chairs at that table then people have to choose where to sit and they're going to decide that if you've got important things to say, then they have to sit next to the important person, which leads to having place cards set up, which leads to people entering the room and seeing the place cards and immediately deciding that, okay, that person must be more important than me, but I must be important, more important than this person, and which is why it became really important to get rid of that damn table. So it, it really is a nice little look into the problems of uh, uh, it's not enough to be highly creative. You have to run a business that allows 
creative people to get stuff done as a major team. Uh, so you, you don't do that by saying, you know what, we're not going to have any walls anywhere. We're just going to have a giant porch with natural grass <laughs> and you're not allowed to wear shoes or any pants that go below, below the knee because we're not into that corporate stuff. Well, no, you have to run a business. So uh, great stuff. I'm only about four or five chapters into it right now. Uh, but it's 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 becoming a really, really cool book and with a lot of insights that I would never have figured out. I can't wait. Another great book. This is the problem. There are so many great books at audible.com. <laughs> really tough to pick your first one. There's a huge variety, though. So go over to audible.com, browse around. When you're ready, you got the book, go to audible.com slash MacBreak. You'll be signing up for the gold account. That's the book a month subscription. With that, by the way, you get the daily digest of either the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal read to you, which is really great. Uh, you also get the book and pay nothing for the first 30 days. If you cancel on that time, you you keep the book, but you don't have to give them any money. So that's truly free. But if you decide to stick around, you will be thrilled. Enjoy life more, your commutes, your uh, exercise sessions. Audible's just great. I, last night I went to sleep listening uh, to tune in, listening to the Beatles book. It's just uh, so great. Audible.com slash Mac break. Uh, thank you, Yam, in our chat room. Just informed me that uh, coming up, I guess it's right now, um, the FCC's attorney, the uh, Senior Counsel for External Affairs for the Chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, uh, Gigi Sohn, will be monitoring questions on th on the Twitter. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is how far we've come. Use the hashtag FCC Net Neutrality. Uh, or you could follow the discussion, FCC Net Neutrality on Twitter. Now, we don't, you know, the interesting point uh, in this whole conversation is we still haven't seen the rules. We'll see them presumably tomorrow when Chairman Wheeler presents those rules to the commissioners and says, what do you think? Should we open a period of public comment? That's what they're going to vote on tomorrow. Um, but I guess they understand that how, what a hot button topic this is. And so uh, they're already, even before the rules come out, at least entertaining people's questions. FCC. Well, and, and I think that this is this this happened uh, on the votes on Thursday, right? Uh, Thursday, not tomorrow. Yeah. So, so for the listeners, I think that the, the one of the things this is the opportunity to continue to push the put the heat on, you know, on the folks that are involved in this. So, I mean, the, you know, we shouldn't be letting up. No, <laughs> and I, I it may be the case that uh, uh, Chairman Wheeler is thinking about what he's going to ask about <laughs> i don't know uh, well and i but i think that also the the, the, the real question is is that if, I, I think that if he, he doesn't think he's got enough people to you know move this forward with a vote he may delay it and i think that that once it gets delayed i think it it dies here's gg apparently using tweet deck <laughs> monitoring the twitter i don't know but that looks like that big red staples button right behind her <laughs> there i think she's going to slap that and say that was easy yeah, the easy button. Uh, I'm GGB Sohn, FCC. It's all going to be very, very civil. Everybody's being polite. Oh, I can only imagine what these tweets are looking like. <laughs> um, well, let's look. A number, what's interesting is a number of members of Congress are uh, using that hashtag right now. Senator Bernie Saunders from Vermont says the FCC is not dealing with widget production, it's dealing with the issue of how we create a vibrant democracy where people hear all points of view. Uh, Anna Eshoo, who is a representative from Silicon Valley, many constituents calling for Title II reclassification, as am I. That's the one that says that broadband providers are common carriers. To ensure strong FCC net neutrality rules, will the FCC commit to considering this option? Thank you, Anna Eshoo. Um, this is this is really... You know, uh, what, what, what may be uh, hum not humorous or ironic or whatever is is that the, the fact that the industry pushed so hard for this to happen and, and what they end up with is reclassification as a result. And they probably would have been happy if they just left. Well, yeah, AT&T uh, filed this week a, a brief, uh, I presume for the FCC, saying whatever you do, don't classify the Internet uh, service providers as common carriers that would burden them with far more regulations than mere net neutrality. It would be a, a. But I think that that's a good. I think that's a really good lesson for the the industry that's trying to push this forward, is for for them to realize that that's all we're going to talk about every time they bring it up, every time they try to to, to pull back on net neutrality. What everyone else is going to push back for is is reclassification, 
um, and they risk that every time they bring up the conversation. And I yeah. think that's a that's it was useful. funny. I think every part of the world that has common carrier and local loop unbundling has not only cheaper service, but way, way better service because suddenly infrastructure and quality of service becomes competitive. Competitive. Mm -hmm. The key is yeah. competition. And I like what you said about uh, unbundling, uh, open loop unbundling, because that's one thing that has kept competition from happening in the U.S. Cable carriers uh, have exclusive access to their own cable. So if you have Comcast or Cox or Time Warner, only they can provide internet over those cables. It's not the case with telephone lines, as we know. And I see no reason why the FCC shouldn't require the same of cable companies. That by itself might be enough. That would maybe make us a first-class citizen on the internet again. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I, 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 I know we've talked a lot about this. And you know what? It's not over. And we're going to talk a lot more after Thursday. Um, but I think, boy, I'm really gratified by the incredible... Uh, amount of conversation and outcry. Uh, you know, you don't see it on CNN. You don't see it on your local news. <laughs> but you do see it on the internet. Uh, in fact, Ben Collins says that. Is TV blacking out net neutrality coverage? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, think this is, I think this is a huge topic. Ben's writing for Esquire magazine. Is there a media blackout on the net neutrality story? We'll find out today. Will a Twitter disaster finally be enough to make net neutrality an issue TV can care about, and of course he's referring to this chat that's going on. I well, think I mean, it might I be over. Actually, very, I think this might be very illustrative of, of the, the the growing power of the internet versus TV. You know, it used to be the TV was really where you had to get to to move that forward, but for things to constantly be scuttled without any coverage at all, I think in in many ways by TV not covering it, they undermine their own relevancy. Yeah. You know, um, as we keep on looking at these things moving forward. Very hopeful. I am very hopeful. Uh, I think that what, what has become very clear is that we're paying attention and they can't just, you know, sneak this stuff by. Yeah. I'm uh, looking forward to the change where historically the people who vote the most are the, are the youngest and the oldest. Uh, and the fact that now we're getting into an older generation of people who grew up with technology and grew up with the internet, that we are going to be the AARP people at 72, 73, <laughs> you know, boarding the senior trolley to the voting center. And we want net neutrality and yes. we want to make sure that we have uh, we have access to encryption and we want to make sure that the law enforcement can get access to our data. That's going to be an interesting shift in the next 10 to 20 years, I think. Yeah. <sighs> hey, let me you ask you about 1093, uh, Mr. Rene Ritchie. When are we going to see that? Uh, sometime between now and WWDC, if Apple holds to their previous <laughs> patterns. I mean, that's what they usually do. They're working on it. They're, there's no real pressure for it. It does a lot of things like the 4K display. That's why I'm uh, asking, because I bought a 4K <laughs> display. Oh, not, yeah. So, again, like, we don't want it out too early, because then there will be a lot of bugs that annoy us even more than having to wait for it would. <laughs> um, so that's true. When people... When they release the developer seeds and developers are like, we're really happy with this one. That's when I kind of want it to be released. So uh, I bought the, I got, I finally got, uh, uh, I had to keep up with the, uh, with the Brownleys. Marquez <laughs> Brownlee, MKBHD. He's been, you know, he was on Twitter, Twit and last week and said, oh, I got the 4K display. And, uh, so I guess there's only two that are worth getting the Sharp and the Asus. Both are, I think they're the same panel made by just with different branding on them. Both apparently can do 60 hertz, which your you said your boss at uh, uh, Marcus, yeah, Marcus has has three 4K displays on his yep. Mac Pro. Wh which ones does he have? The Sharp. I uh, no, I think he got the Dells when they were on sale. The over Dells the holidays. were cheap. Yeah, yeah. Now apparently, even the Dells can go to 60 hertz with this new 10.9.3. Yes. So you're never you're never blinded by a stuttery cursor ever again. And then the other issue, actually maybe a bigger issue, is scaling. Because <laughs> when you're running a display that is, uh, what, what, is what is what is 4K? Uh, 40, uh, four, what is it? It's four times more than p yeah. so than, than, what, than a 1080p display. All the icons in this. The text is so me. that's the part of ten of uh, ten nine three that's not finished yet. Is the ideal would be like a Retina display on the Mac. Apparently, they're going to do that. The large screen yeah. and scale it down. Yeah, and they're working on that right now. It doesn't look like it's perfectly finished yet. Oh, but okay. That's probably the last hundred yards on on ten. So, so Apple on. opened this beta program to the public. You don't have to be a developer. Um, you can you can get into the beta seed program uh, by just going to appleseed.apple.com and sign up. And all you have to do is have an Apple ID. You do not have to pay 99 bucks. You do not have to be a developer. 
Uh, you can join it. That You'll download a little thing that will change your machine in some subtle way, and all of a sudden the App Store will offer an update to 10.9.3. Yeah. I did it this morning so I could hook up this 4K display, but was that a mistake, Renee, Richie? No, I mean, for you, Leo, it's not a mistake. For for a normal person who only has one machine and doesn't have something like a secondary drive to boot from, stay, stay, uh, you know, whatever curse word you want to put in, away from it. Because <laughs> it's not meant for you. You you give up standard Apple care, standard Apple support. It's really a sign that says, I am an expert user and I am willing to take on this responsibility myself. And I hope Apple's making that really, really clear to people. Yeah. But for someone like you, someone who has multiple machines, someone who's happy booting from secondary volumes, then it's a fun thing to play with. I this I, I so I'm not boasting, but humble brag, humble brag. Mac Pro, two cinema displays, 27 inch cinema displays, and in the middle, the 31 and a half inch 4K monitor. It's just I un thought you look a little more tan, Leo. I, I, well, I, I can't that turn out. on the I was, monitor because I, I, I don't have I the right cable. Say, like, if, have, have you figured out exactly where to put the microwave burrito to have it automatically <laughs> cook on your desktop? Look, I'm already <laughs> sterile. It's not going to make it any worse. So it's got it's, uh, but it looks like nice because the, the the it doesn't match, but the middle monitor is big, a little bigger, and it just looks like it has wings. You yeah. can run NORAD That's, out of Petaluma. Have you done any? Have you done any uh, flight simulators in it? I, mean, I it can't do like anything. I don't have the right cable. So. In order to make this work, you have to have a the, – the monitor has a full-size display port, and then I have a Thunderbolt 2 port on my Mac Pro. So you have to have a, a mini display port to maxi display port cable. So I ordered one. I'll have one later today. But I was uh, saying we probably have one downstairs. You know what? There probably is one in the studio, but I didn't want to take a chance because there's nothing sadder than sitting at your desk. And both these side monitors are working, but the middle one is just this black hole. It's power-saving mm -hmm. mode. <laughs> Anyway, by, by and I did it for, say. again, I always do this. I do it for you, the people, so that I can report <laughs> on how 4K support is going and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We appreciate it, Leo. It's just for you. Yep. But you do need, apparently, to get 60 hertz, you do not. You do need a display port connection, not an HDMI connection, because HDMI just won't do it. And you yeah. need to have 10.9.3. Uh, because what I was reading, this is weird. What it sends out is two 1920 by 1080 signals. Like it's two, it, it makes it two monitors. It's like dual link uh, DVI right. was in the old days. Yeah, because right. even now the display, I mean, there are rumors of Thunderbolt 3 already, but even now it's hard to push that much data through the cables we have now. Yeah. 3840 by 2160. And then supposedly yeah. they're going to have this scaling that they do on the, on the retina displays enough pixels to show the entire internet at once you know? <laughs> I, I, I can't tell you how happy that makes me though the little boy version of myself who had the apple II tv uh, tv set plugged into an apple IIe e with, with with just green phosphor and just seeing that i've got one two three monitors all ultra high definition and whatever i want to put on any one of them it works great i, th I think that, that is to that is totally my that is totally the right style to have multiple monitors as opposed to one big one i'd rather, I'd rather have three small ones that are just about this big right. than the one big 60 inch right well but i have to say 31 and a half inch uh 16 9 monitors a pretty big ass monitor <laughs> oh, so it's, it's pretty it's you know that's you, you, you almost you almost want a virtual ping pong game <laughs> So that you can actually, that's... I want, that, is there, is there something, is there like a screensaver I can get that will scroll all the way around? It'll take a day they, and a half to get Leo, across Leo, those Basically pixels. what you're saying is that if any of our listeners have any blown pixels on their display, it's because Leo needed that pixel for his monitor. <laughs> that's my pixel! I put a picture in the chat room, Leo. That's before the latest beta enabled him to do all three, though. Oh, good. All right. So this is your boss's setup. Yeah. Uh, at, uh, oh, yeah. But see, now, see, yeah. Yeah. So he's got two of those. Yeah. They're big. Wow. The Lawrence of Arabia. The setup. problem with the MacBook Pro is it's only got two Thunderbolts out, so the third one has to go in the HDMI, so you have a little, you're giving up a little bit there. But right. with the Mac Pro, you should have no problem. Okay. So <laughs> we'll see. I, f I feel like there's no way this is going to work. <laughs> this won't end well. <laughs> this is not going to end well. Um. All right. I'll, I'll send you a picture. Perfect. <laughs> so many pixels. <laughs> I don't even, I have no reason to do this. I have no need for this. Why, but that's that's exactly the reason why you should. You would not be a Mac user if you didn't just simply <laughs> say, oh, you mean that theoretically I could have this many displays attached? 
let's test that out. Right. That's and why you cross the sea and climb the mountain, Leo, because it's there. <laughs> exactly. And uh, I'm still less than uh, Ryan Shrout over uh, of our This Week in Computer Hardware show, the PC Perspective. He has five. Count you have to come over to my, my house sometime, Leo. <laughs> Alex has a I've vest. Got, of well, now I'm going to feel bad. What do you got? Uh, well, it's not all connected to one computer. So it's, but I have an array of, um, it's, um, it's only got 10 monitors right now, but it's, it's capable of 10. <laughs> yeah, but I pulled, I pulled sections out of it so that I could put up some other things. So it's not, <laughs> it's not all on, it's not all on at one time. That's, that's at home. This is not <laughs> your office. This is time. home. Not, the, not well, how many of those are live office. shots from so drones? It's how, I do, it's how I do remote training. Uh, it's, it's a test test oh. bed for that. So it's okay. so I've got a bunch of a bunch of stuff that's so I have like confidence monitors so that no matter which way I turn, I can uh, I can see what I'm editing and because I'm edit you know it's kind of like your office, your other studio, um, except if monitors were all in front of you and you could turn in a couple different directions and have confidence and see question engine stuff and you know. Here's my question: How can I do this? Is it like Osmandius and the Watchmen? Is that what Alex has? <laughs> I don't know. I, I I keep on falling asleep in the middle of the Watchmen. I'm not geeky enough. I think I just I I think it's, I feel it just, it's too long, and I'm I've already had too much gin or something. I, I watch it. I get like halfway through where he's underground, and he's got some ship, and then I fall asleep. He so, watches like twelve TVs at once. The seat program is kind yeah. of neat. I don't remember Apple ever doing this, allowing people to download a beta version of uh, OS X without being a developer. <laughs> Kind of. I mean, they years and years ago, before they really uh, locked down the developer program, you could get access. Not, not only that, you, you can almost get access to pricing, I think, in the very, very early days. Ah. But yeah, I, what, what I'm concerned about is that uh, I'm hoping that people follow Renee's advice and they, they need to understand that this is beta for a reason. It really isn't ready for human consumption yet. And I'm wondering what knock-on effect this is going to have for support in the Apple Store, where something do, if something isn't working now. And you bring it in, and you kind of would you would you kind of get zorched out of support by saying, "Oh, it's a beta, so right. now we don't we don't know how to test what's going on because it could be just the beta." And how is this going to affect uh, makers uh, of ind independent developers of software, where now they've got to work on bug fix reports that could be just the simple fact that they have they're running on uh, on a computer that is essentially made out of cheese whiz and broken Lego bits? Yeah. Well, I think the big, the big advantage for us is users, though, who are waiting. And I'm still, you know, most of my computers are all still on 1086. On um, so, what? Uh, so we, slow, we slowly add nine. There's a bunch of video stuff that we have on, on the back end that doesn't work as well in, in the new one, yeah. in the new version. So yeah. so we've been very slowly, like, adding one computer at a time. But the big advantage, and one of the reasons we like to do that is we like everybody else to test for us. And so in a lot of ways, by making this more open, it also means that there's more gamma testers you know, that can, um, you know, bang on things and give theoretically Apple a lot more feedback before they actually have to, to pull the trigger so yeah. we don't complain about the release version. I'm, I'm also, I'm also a little this, bit curious. They? I'm sorry, go ahead. I, oh, I, thought, I thought Microsoft has done open betas in the past as well. Yeah, exactly. But that's that's actually... Oh, yeah, Microsoft does it all the time, yeah. You know, that, that kind of ties into what I was going to say, too, because they don't just simply, it's not just for bug reporting. It's for we're produce, we're introducing a radical new feature and we want to get we wanted to get it into the hands of people who are highly motivated to try out new things. And so it's not as though the version that actually ships to consumers is just the developer edition with some fixes. You've seen entire features come and go or tweaked amazingly from the start to the finish based on usability feedback. So when I when Apple first announced this, one of the thoughts going through my head is uh, it's no secret that the next version of, uh, of uh, Mac OS is probably going to have a UI overhaul is one of the reasons for this, the ability to put some of these radical changes in the field early so that they can simply say, okay, people do not like the, the lightness of these fonts. People wish want a little bit more guidance and highlights on buttons. Uh, and so they know that they have the ability to fix that before they send it to the general population. This is exactly what happened when they redesigned iOS 7. Uh, if you compare the version that they released to developers at WWDC last year to the version that shipped, it was substantially the same interface, but there were a lot of subtle tweaks made to make it easier to navigate. A lot of the translucency was toned down a great deal to, uh, to tone down some of the confusion. So that's that's what went through my mind as I'm thinking about this. If they are really doing a radical redesign of macOS, it's a good thing to put that in front of as many people as possible before you are telling every or telling or forcing everybody to force uh, to uh, upgrade to the new one. 
And there's answer- no amount of QA or development in the world that's equal to a million oh, yeah. users pounding on your software. And I think Microsoft yeah. got a lot of benefit with the public uh, betas that it's done of the last couple of versions of Windows. It's been really, I think, a big part of uh, success. They don't. They, yeah. I mean, that's how you. That's how you find the bugs. You get all these. We, we and especially for Microsoft because hardware is not heterogeneous. There's all kinds of different hardware. Yeah. Yeah, it's not it's homogenous. It's it is here. heterogeneous. In, insert mail.app joke here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got a whole story about mail.app I'll share with you. Um, real quickly, uh, somebody, I think Beatmaster in the chat room said, uh, does this mean journalists will have access and can report about it? And as Renee ad, pointed out in the chat room, no, no you're still, you signed the NDA. I had to sign an NDA. But my, my feeling is 1093 is out any minute now. I mean, mm -hmm. at worst case, a yeah. month, right? Also, also, I looked very carefully at the language. I, I didn't join the program chiefly for that reason, reason but the, the, the language in the agreement explicitly says that your secrecy is limited to only things that you could not have found out right. uh, unless you were part of the program. So if Apple Insider or any of these other sites were to report on something, then you are you have the ability to comment on that so right. long as you're not saying, well, I have access to the beta and here's right. what my experiences were right. on my G4 cube. But I, I did I, not download it, so I'm not on D8 either. I'm, I'm kind of yeah. very interested in the idea of how this 4K thing will work. The other question uh, that people have is, can you use the cheap 4K displays, the sub-$1,000 4K TVs and so forth, uh, with it? And I think the, the consensus seems to be it, you might be able to. You probably, but you'll probably be limited to 30. You won't get 60 hertz. Rate. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, it's unknown, I guess. And I'm not going to go out and buy a Seiki or something just to see. But um, and that doesn't bother some people. I and mean, some people are much more sensitive to visual refresh rates than others. So uh, if right. you're lucky enough that, you know, the cursor right. doesn't bother you and it bleeds a little bit of a trail, then, you know, save your money. Right. Uh, I'm excited. I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be playing with it tonight. And now the chat room's challenging me. They said, well, if, if you do that, then you've got to get the 128 gigabyte memory <laughs> for 2000 bucks. I can't now. Now I do have to. I, I'll I'll defer to you, Alex, on this one because I have a 16 gigabyte, which seems to me a lot. Uh, well, I, think, I think for what you're doing, I, I don't think that there's any reason to go more than more than 16. I, I don't. I but mean, you would you, know, you wouldn't even look at it when it was 12 gigabytes. You said no, 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 we can't use that. Uh, I mean, 16 is what we we really consider kind of a minimum to do that's a lot of the stuff that we're doing. Point. Yeah. Um. Yeah. That you know that's where we where we, you know that avoids a lot of problems. I mean, RAM and RAM and, and hard drive space are the two things that generally get, you know, the biggest hits in performance is where, you know, when you improve those is where you usually get that. And so you start opening up big Photoshop files or you start opening up, you know, 3D renders. There's lots yeah. of things that start to suck up a lot of RAM. But if you're just doing the, the a lot of the stuff that most of us normally do, I don't see any reason to have more than this. You know what I'm most excited about and actually will use this for is Lightroom and Photoshop where uh, right. because of the scaling... I'll just as with a MacBook Pro Retina, I'll be able to see the interface normally. Um, I'll keep the image, the full size image, on one screen. I'll have the editing image on another screen, and that image will be one to one on high res photos. And I think that that's going to be really nice to have that kind of uh, clarity at that size. Yeah, being able to move a lot of your palettes um, in Photoshop, especially yeah, off into other yeah. other screens. I mean, that's uh, a, a I've never done it with three. I've had three up, but I've never really been able to settle into three monitors. I really prefer two. Um, but moving all of my stuff over for a lot of my applications mm -hmm. uh, definitely allows you to really focus on what you're working on. With Lightroom, uh, two is probably plenty because what you have is one display will have the image full screen that you've selected to work on. And then the palette and the tools and the and the thumb, thumbnail, smaller version, will be on the main right. screen. And so you can look at the... Yeah. And no, I don't know not. what the color accuracy on the... Uh, on the Asus is or what it's an IGZO, which is a, supposedly the IGZOs are pretty accurate, but I don't know what the I don't know what the color space is or anything. It probably won't match the Apple monitor. So you can you can oftentimes get those pretty close, almost any monitor pretty close with something like a spider. You know, right. the little spider. Um, you know, you put those on and they get. It's not it's not as accurate as a color accurate monitor, but it's within a, a hair. I kind of <laughs> learned my lesson because I bought that cheap monitor, um, the thirty inch. Remember that way back when I bought a 30-inch display right. from, uh, uh, whatchamacallem, those cheap guys? Shimian. No, no, I didn't buy the Shimian. I know no. you like the Shimian. I just, but it was, it was the yeah. same time as you bought the Shimian, but I got it from uh, the cable company, you know, whatchamacallem. Oh, and, Monoprice. Yeah, Monoprice. They had a 30-inch monitor. It was fairly cheap. 
and I could never get and it, it, it. The cinema display looks so much better. Having that next to a cinema display was just unusable because it's like, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. Right. And I could never get it anywhere close, ever. Well, and was that consistency? I mean, because a lot of times it's it's how long it lasts, it's brightness, it's consistency it's a lot of across things. the entire image. It's a lot or was it all of, of it? Yeah, and the colors, I think the color space was different. Right. Um, anyway, we'll see. We'll see. I, I'm not buying 128 gigs of RAM. What do you think I'm not Someone on Twitter has to buy it first and then. <laughs> yeah, not okay. until Marcus well, Brownlee wait. does. If Marcus Brownlee buys it, then you better believe I'm going out and getting it. Damn him. Yeah, I'm just trying to think. I, I just realized, I think that there was a, I can remember a time when it was, I think it was, was it 64 megs of RAM was 2000? Oh, yeah. I remember eight megs of RAM was a lot. I remember going into a <laughs> Egghead store, not New Egg, but Egghead. Remember them? And listening to the shop guy said, well, the ideal setup for your Mac would be eight, eight megs, megs of RAM. You got two megs for the uh, operating system, two megs for the app, a two meg RAM disk, and uh, I can't remember. Oh, two meg cash. Now, eight megs. I had, I, had, I had four megs in my little PC that I did my first my print work on for Prime Sports Network, and yeah. I had to, like, save things in parts. You know, like, yeah. like because there wasn't enough RAM to keep it all. You know, there's only so big of an image I could do for an ad because. <laughs> you guys had megs? Megs? <laughs> we had megs. Megabytes. Kilobits. We had kilobits. Well, of course, we had it tough. <laughs> and we by had core memory. <laughs> Which we had to adjust manually with a tip of a pencil, which we had to borrow from our fathers. And there were punch cards everywhere. <laughs> Gary uh, from, uh, you know, uh, Gary Koffler, I do tech in our chat room, and a good friend of the show, said that Apple that Apple II high-res screen, Andy, was 280 by 192. I think it was 240 by 192. 240 by 192? Like well, depending on whether you were HDR or HDR2. Okay. So 3840 did, did, by 2860. Did you want the three lines of text underneath, or did you want to just have the full screen of graphics? <laughs> Pretty funny. Did you have funny. the Beagle Brothers text, uh, Beagle uh, Brothers. text utilities built in? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Love those Beagle Brothers. I don't hate Marcus. I love Marcus, but I'm jealous as heck of Marcus. And uh, and But he's earned every bit of his success. And, uh, I, you know, I just... Just trying to keep up with the Joneses here. That's all there is. Our show today brought to you by LegalZoom.com. Hey, it's not a law firm. It's a self-help uh, place. You, you self-help services at your specific direction, doing what you need to do to start your business, to protect your family. You don't need a white shoe, high-priced, $350 an hour lawyer to create an LLC or even a Chapter S or C corporation. You can do it for 99 bucks on LegalZoom.com. That's what we did. We're still using those corporation papers. If you're going to start a business, you actually really do want to do this. Furthermore, if you have a trademark, you know, a brand or a logo, you got to protect it or somebody else will steal it. And it's only 169 bucks. LegalZoom gets a lot of the work you need to do for starting your business done. Starting it and running it. And, of course, if you got to protect your family, too. One of the great things about Le with your last will and testament, 69 bucks. One of the great things about LegalZoom now is they, the legal Zoom uh, legal plan. They have pre-contracted pre flat rate, low flat rate fees with attorneys in every state. Uh, they're, they're independent. They'll help you answer your questions, help you get your stuff done. And this is so cool. You can look at their profiles and unedited reviews from legal Zoom customers to choose the attorney that's right for you. So you don't pay an hourly fee. You, you pay a monthly, f low, flat monthly rate, and you've got advice. I think this is such a great... I'm, I cannot tell you how valuable this is. They should get a Medal of Honor because they have, they have made it easy for people to do the stuff they need to start their own business, and that's the best thing in the world for our economy. LegalZoom.com. If you use the offer code MBW, you could take 10 bucks off at checkout. So if you're looking for an offer code... Look no farther than MBW at LegalZoom.com. LegalZoom provides legal help through independent attorneys and self-help services, but it's not a law firm. Frankly, it's better. LegalZoom.com. Okay. Do you have any questions, uh, Leo, from the... Are you doing that thing? Uh, that thing is running. Should Mac we give out... We didn't give out the URL. I forgot about that. So what's the URL uh, for our question engine? Uh, it's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash M-B-W-4-0-2. I could have figured that out. Last so, week it was a, we 
Last week we didn't do it soon enough. So we got, uh, we got some good questions here. We've got a couple that have been popular. All right, let's take a look here. You want to start with with the rumored multitasking on IO8? We haven't talked about this yet. Nope. This comes from uh, Jehudu Saar in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, the story I heard it this morning on Tech News Today with Mike Elgin is that iOS 8 will have multitasking, windowing, panes. And I think Jehuda has a great question. Wouldn't this fundamentally change what the iPad is supposed to be? I agree with him. It's a bad idea. What do you think, Renee? So there's a couple. I saw Mark Gurman reporting about it this morning, so it might be making the rounds. But uh, what's interesting with this rumor is if you look at mobile, uh, very specifically, especially with Apple, they wanted to do full screen apps because it's easier for a mainstream purpose. Their goal since the creation of computing at Apple has been to make computers more accessible to more people, sort of empowering rather than just you know power user stuff. And the full screen app did that because you're in an app, you press the home button as your escape nozzle, you're back on the home screen, you're in another app. It's very simple. The problem with a lot of early mobile implementations of multi-window, whether it was the cards and stacks in WebOS or the Snap stuff in Windows uh, or the, the stuff that Samsung was doing, is that it really had minimal benefit. You could look at two things, but there was no interaction. And anyone who's ever used OS X knows that one of the benefits of uh, multitasking is dragging and dropping between applications or in other ways of making sure that both those applications are doing something more than the great, uh, greater than the sum of their parts. And what's interesting to me about this rumor is that that's part of this rumor, that Apple is enabling drag and drop between applications. So rather than just having something that could be in one app, like a text editor and a browser, you'll be able to put apps there and drag information between the two. So like multitasking, like notification center, like control center, for 80% of the population, it will be invisible. You'll never see it. You won't have to worry about it. You can use your iPad just like you always did. But for those tech, for people who wanted more, uh, who wanted to be able to use the iPad to do more multitasking, more computer-like work, they'll be able to open up this functionality and enjoy it. And it's also interesting to me that, you know, Craig Federici is very different than Steve Jobs, very different than Scott Forrestal. He tends more towards the geek and more towards the power user feature. Like battery shaming in OS X would never have made it into, um, onto the Mac in previous years. That was a, a departure in Apple's policy. And I think that if this is rumor is true, and if those implementation details are true, then it's kind of showing us how you can how Apple is increasingly servicing the needs of power users as well as mainstream users. Would it be a bigger screen? Yeah, I, I mean, think, would it be just on an air? No. Same, yeah, same thing. Yeah. I, I think it would be a, a long delayed, a long, long needed move uh, because really? Apple has always oh, Apple has always had a remember never, never forget that the iPad Air is a five hundred dollar computer that right. in some configurations is a, almost a nine hundred dollar computer right. that has a desktop class microprocessor in it that is capable of doing eighty to ninety percent of the work that most people want a uh, a notebook to do, which is why it's been a little bit befuddling to me that some of the simple things they could add to this to make it easier to use as a laptop replacement just aren't there. Uh, of uh, I've, I've used the Snap. Uh, the the, the uh, snap screens features in uh, in Windows, which uh, actually works extremely well because it's not as though you need to have two windows open simultaneously and your full attention is on both of them equally. It really is just as simple as I'm watching a movie, but I also want to keep an eye on Twitter or I am working on uh, I'm writing and editing a document, but I also want to be able to occasionally look up facts uh, in a little sidebar uh, window browser. Uh, and the ability to simply split the screen in any trivial way would be a huge enhancement, as would the ability to have keyboard shortcuts, as would the ability to switch between apps really quickly from a Bluetooth keyboard. And so that's something I really, really want. At the same time, I have to acknowledge that what I'm asking for is a MacBook Air. Yeah. So it's possible that so it's so it's so it's if Apple, if Apple gave me everything I wanted, that's what I would wind up with. So it's possible that as I look at rumors like this, Apple's answer to that is, well, look, we for eight hundred ninety nine dollars, you can have a real Macintosh that is only marginally larger than your than your current iPad that can do so much more of what you apparently want this thing to do. It doesn't have touch. I think, I think a lot of us. Well, I think a lot of us, I mean, and, and my issue is, I mean, I carry around, you know, I carry around a couple laptops and a couple uh, tablets. And the thing is, is that I want that tablet to be my computer, like my little computer that I work. It just doesn't have quite enough to, to, to do that. And, and, and this um, being able to split these screens and being able to have a keyboard, all the stuff that Andy was talking about, really, I think it does open up a whole nother uh, subset of people that want to move away from a laptop, but can't quite get there for, and I don't know if I'd do it 
all day, every day, but it would definitely be half my day or 75% or of my day I could use that. But right now, it just doesn't have enough for me to, to get my, my work done. I also think as we look at the merger, I still think we're, we're slowly moving. And I don't think that they're necessarily depreciating uh, OS 10, but I think that, you know, there is, we're seeing OS 10 have some things like the battery and other little bits and pieces of it that, that come from, from the iOS world. I think the iOS world moving towards um, you know, OS 10 also makes a lot of sense from a, you know, we're slowly merging this idea of a computer into something completely different. There's a character on uh, the HBO show Veep, which is Julia Louis-Dreyfus's 30-minute uh, comedy show. Is her kid? Why are you showing Alex? Yeah, thank you. Uh, who, my lighting is so good, Leo. <laughs> I know. We want to see more Andy. Alice? I'm not saying that, but I've I am some talking. I've got some <laughs> texture. with the, I'm very pleased with the lighting today. I don't know why. I just feel bad because you have to stay, sit there, Andy, and pretend you're interested in what I'm saying when this camera's oh. on you. And I'm so actually, I'm, I'm actually interested. <laughs> there's a character on this show, which is a great show, by the way. Her campaign manager, Dan, who carries two iPads in his hand. <laughs> because <laughs> one is not enough. Then one of the characters says, hey, watch out. Soon you're going to need three. I think it was all stimulated by this ad from Samsung. You remember this one? It's an extremely simple tool, but also extremely pointy. <laughs> it's been used to make tentative appointments and to cheat at golf. <laughs> Students have used it it's to play pencil. ceiling darts. It's, wait a second, what's hiding behind this pencil? <laughs> ah, an iPad Air. Almost didn't see it back there. And what's this? Hide behind the iPad? Oh. Ah, the even thinner Galaxy Tab Pro 10.1. Interesting. Not only are you thinner, your HD screen is killer for more robo beatdown action. And would you look at that? There you go. The Galaxy Tab even does multitasking. So you're thinking this is what... At once. Yeah. I mean, this not, is what not, people not want. Thing thing on tiling. At once. Again, the ability to simply have one little utility app hiding or er, 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 intruding on the, the side of the screen. Right. Because that, that is, as again, as someone who uses the iPad heavily, that's the one big frustrating thing. And during my two or three weeks uh, of immersion, uh, full immersion of using the uh, Microsoft Surface, that's the one thing I absolutely missed when I went back to my iPad a few weeks later. The ability, it just seems silly not to be, uh, given that given that so many of the major uh, iOS apps are already articulated both as a phone screen and as an iPad screen. The ability to simply say, look, if I want to minimize this this app but also have it on the screen, can you just give me the iPhone view of this and just let me tuck that on the side of the screen? Is that something you could make happen for me? Well, I feel uh, you do it at your own peril, though. I mean, it just makes it so much... I mean, one of the advantages of the iPad is its simplicity and the idea that you do one thing and you're full screen. And that's, that's yeah, that's the question like, is, is that does, does, a, does the average user need to see that as well? So the, yeah. the other thing is, is that, that you could have it so that if you didn't know it existed, it would just be the same modal system. Oh, yeah, but I, can I tell you this from my, my use of the Galaxy Note? It pops up by accident when you least expect that's it. That's Samsung it, interface. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, okay, yeah. all right. But it's annoying. I mean, you know, it's not completely invisible. It's there. Maybe yeah, maybe Apple see, will hot, see, have a switch that a, says never show that ever. That's what I'm saying. I, I, I can see it coming out, uh, a way to test this as a default off. And right. You have to go into settings and turn it on. And like so if you really want to go down that rabbit hole, you can. But you know when you right. do that, no, that 90% of users will never know it's there. Well, that's it, Leo. That's like the fine. multitasking that's, gestures was tried in beta, and it was left yeah. off when it was put in the shipping product. You had to right. go turn that on so you wouldn't right. accidentally yeah. pinch and lose your screen. Right. That, that's that's the beauty of this kind of a feature. For the first two or three months or two or three weeks when people are brand new with the device and very easily confused, they will not discover this because it's a setting that's been turned off. But as they get more adept with this after three months, four months, five months, and now they're starting to attack what are the pain points of this experience and what what can I change? That's when they start saying, well, maybe there is something in settings I can find there. And whoops, there it is. And they tap that slider and now they have the ability I to use this gesture. And I've often thought that, that that would be a really good model for a lot of, a lot of software. Uh, one of the mistakes that we made with some of the software that we wrote, uh, the Conduit being, being one of them and, and even some of the other ones, was that it's very complex when you start it. When you open it, it's very right. hard to understand. And there's, there's too many options. And, and I think that a lot of applications would benefit, even like Photoshop and so on and so forth, from, from having three versions of it. You know, there, here's this beginner one that just lets you play with stuff and really quickly understand it. Now we're going to introduce you to layers. And now you'll be introduced to channels. You let's know, move, you know, let's just, move quickly through uh, the next few questions. We're going to yep. wrap it up in a bit. But here's uh, from Brent York, question two on the question engine. Greensboro, North Carolina. What would Apple have to do besides a bigger screen size to get Leo and Andy to switch back to an iPhone full-time? You first, Andy. 
Um, mostly it's a change in a lot of basic philosophies. I want applications to be able to interact with each other far, far more intimately than they can on iOS right now. The ability to, if, I, if there's a piece of information inside one app on my Android device and I want to do something with it, the chances are I can make two taps and have it available to whatever other service I want. Uh, and also the ability to actually just what we've been talking about uh, uh, just a few minutes ago, the ability to say that I know that this could that this feature could possibly lead to a rough experience for me. However, at this point, I really, really want this to behave the way that I wanted to behave. And I'm willing to take that risk. So the ability to have, for instance, an app draw on top of another app so that you have a text messaging app that you don't necessarily have to switch between uh, the, uh, the the mail app you're using right now just to, part, to keep uh, keep up with the text messaging thing. The ability to have different launchers installed. These are all things that if you don't allow the user to do that, you'll have a much cleaner and much more stable experience for that user. But again, three, four, five months later, when that user is very, very adept at this device, it's okay for them to decide, what if I were to able to just simply go to the App Store or buy an alternative launcher that works more the way that I would like it to, uh, and then simply tap to install, and it installs and it works. So that's it's not so much a larger screen or even the rumored features of iOS 8 to let you cut and paste between uh, apps like that. It really is the uh, fundamental philosophy that says that we trust you to get into trouble and get yourself out of that trouble if you so desire. Yeah, I, I'd agree with you. I, I think that the the... the grid of icons of springboard it seems feels fairly limited if they fix that it, or gave me an option there and frankly you got to give me an option on the keyboard i love the iphone there's nothing wrong with the iphone the apps are absolutely superb but i just i need uh i the grid of icons is too limiting for me i want i want something a little more flexible and i i would i just can't use the apple keyboard i'm sorry it's just every time i use it i just want to punch myself in the face <laughs> or i feel like i have one more or a couple more here real quickly mark shepherd Wichita, Kansas. Uh, well, I guess we kind of did that discussion about the newly rumored iOS 8 features. We really, again, and I really want to emphasize rumor, multitasking pains. We've already talked about health book. Is there anything else, Renee Ritchie, that uh, is in the... That is yeah, the I mean, mill. there's a ton of stuff, but the one thing that's important to remember is that the development of iOS is a continuum. So they'll right. they'll be working on a bunch of features. They'll have to cut it at a certain point. And given the focus on 10.10, .10, a lot of the stuff that's rumored now might end up in, you know, 8 point, so iOS 8.1. Right. So... It, just remember that and you won't be as disappointed come WWDC. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> yep. And yeah, we will probably will learn about this in uh, in June. Do you think, this comes from uh, Stephen Dainty, Stoke-on-Trent, UK. Do you think Angela Arendt, the new uh, head of retail at Apple, will be looking into improving the iTunes and App Store experiences? Are those even in her bailiwick? No. I don't Eddie think so. Too. She's retail, yeah. not... I think she's retail. Yeah, retail, not Retail uh, and online Apple store, which, which is almost like its own division. Right. Uh, Nico Mabasso, Guateng, South Africa. We're getting great questions. That's where I'm from. from. Really? Yep. Wait a minute. Yep. You're South Africa? Yeah, Johannesburg used to be the Transvaal, and now it's Gauteng. What the heck? I didn't even know that about you. Well, Nico, your buddy Renee says hi. Does the iOSification of OS X decrease the need to have a more powerful Mac? Leo says, I, I hope not. <laughs> I, I would say so. I, th I think Apple. I think That's Apple's going to be doing smart things and uh, making the Mac Pro into an outlier device and making more mobile devices and more friendly devices. I think devices. an ARM Mac might well be in the in the works, right? I think. So. I, I think they've it moved. Exists. They, they 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 long they long ago moved beyond the idea that we have to have really good specs on our processors. It's all about what performance do people act or are people actually going to experience with these things. So I think that the trend is to make smaller, simpler, more profitable and more accessible devices rather than now we're going to the next version we're, ne we're now working on a Mac Pro that has two towers on it with a bridge connecting the two I don't <laughs> think that's where they're going yeah there's an ARM Mac and they they, they bring it out every time Intel Absolutely. starts to falter on their right. dates again <laughs> right it's a sort of down well, in Apple Labs and I think for the average user I mean the 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 the, the Air is powerful enough to, to do most of what you do. And an iPad is powerful enough yeah. to do what 90% of the users out yeah. there are doing. So I think that it's, um, you know, I, I definitely think that we're going that direction either way. I mean, we're not really going that direction. We're just not moving. We're not in, in moving forward faster. A question from John Easy, Mountain View, California. Will they reboot the cinema display? Um, and, you know, I have to say that now that I'm buying a 4K display for my Mac Pro, I have to wonder, where is a Mac 4K they were waiting display. for you to buy, Leo. Yeah, maybe that's, that's what it. always happens. WWDC, WWDC. Right. Cinema display, mark my words, cinema display with Apple TV built in. 
Ah. They've been working on it for a while. Um, yeah. And I think like when you see something like 10.9.3 and, and you see the other stuff, it's just a question of getting it to the point where it makes sense for Apple to release it. Very cool. I like I like that idea. We're having fun. This question engine's great. I'll do a couple more and then we'll move on. Uh, no, that's a bad one. Okay. Uh, never mind. Forget it. Those <laughs> were both bad. Thank you, Question Engine. Thank you uh, to Alex Lindsay uh, for his uh, generous donation of the Question Engine software. Here's a picture of a car in an Apple store. Apparently, it was part of a robbery attempt. The car smashed through the glass doors and the security gate at the 4th Street Apple store in Berkeley, California on Friday morning. And uh, apparently some other stuff was stolen. So I think, I think cars have been used a couple times yes. uh, for these because of all the glass. It, it's it not seems the first like, time. And they're all by the road, yep. or a lot of them are by the road. It seems like a good, easy, good way to do that. Or somebody was in a big hurry to get the new iPad. I don't know. <laughs> wouldn't that be interesting if or, or, the next... The, it wouldn't be interesting if the next iteration of Apple stores have some sort of mechanical barrier that they can erect after store closing to prevent this stuff from happening. Well, like, they do. That's what that is. And the car went right through it. There was a safety gate over the glass. Oh, not not not, not a gate. I'm they not need talking like, about how yeah. how, how like concrete. Like now now concrete. that there are, now that there are like pneumatic pylons <laughs> are, that can uh, that can come up to block off a street after hours to make sure that a car cannot barrel down there and do whatever they want to do. Like what embassies have. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nokia, these big metal pieces that pop up. senior Lumia engineer and Nokia's camera expert Ari Partinen just left Microsoft. He's gone to work for Apple. Actually, it happened right after the show last week. He's yeah. the pure, pure view camera expert. Yeah, the resampling stuff. That's amazing because I'm, I'm doing a, a right now. That's a that's a huge one. I'm can't. I'm really if to to add to the to the answer from the last one of the previous questions. One of the things that could really turn me back to the iPhone. Beyond all the other problems I have with it is Apple. If Apple does a camera that is so far beyond anything else that's been done, that would be a real big temptation for me. And what Nokia has done with this peer review technology is just amazing. Even beyond 40 megapixel images, which is really just almost like the, the negative that they use to make a better image from. I'm in the middle of posting a series of, I think, it's eight different uh uh, uh, test photos that I shot with eight different imaging devices. One of them is the Lumia 1020, uh, not set to 40 megapixels, but I've uh, the downsampled uh, five megapixel version that it spits out, and it is kicking butt in a blind taste test of people who just see greater detail, greater sharpness, less less noise. It's making some beautiful pictures, and if Apple can get access to that mojo, or at least or at least that line of thinking that a Nokia executive has about uh, how to do digital imaging. Man, you start off with the greatest, uh, one of the two greatest uh, cameras in the world, and it could absolutely take it to the next orbit. We take a break. We'll come back with your picks of the week. Gentlemen, start your engines. But first, a word from our friends at Squarespace.com, the web hosting site that we love so very much. The best hosting plus the best software combines to give you the best website anywhere. If you haven't tried Squarespace yet, you got to visit squarespace.com and click that Get Started button. You'll get full access to their 25 beautiful templates, their logo creator tool, the apps on the iPad and the iPhone, like the Metric app, which lets you check site stats like page views, unique visitors, social media followers. The blog app, which gets, makes it easy to post, but also monitor comments, change layouts even. It's all so elegant, so beautifully done. The sites never go down. We use it for our Inside Twit blog. And I'll tell you what, we, Lisa and I were talking yesterday. <laughs> we're having so much trouble with our main website. We're thinking, gosh, let's just move the whole thing to Squarespace. So easy to use, but also great support. They've got workshops, webinars online that are free, but live chat and email support 24-7. Not from India, not from Canada, from <laughs> New York City. Actually, Canada would be okay because they're very There's polite. plain as Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, what do you want? Uh, no, from the offices of Squarespace in New York City, uh, the customer help site has great self-help articles and video workshops, and it all starts at just $8 a month and a free domain name when you sign up for a year. All the sites have e-commerce built in. All of them are mobile ready, and all the hosting is done for you, so you don't have to worry about security, patches, updates. It just all works. Start your free trial right now. No credit card needed. Just visit squarespace.com and click the Get Started button. When you do decide to sign up, as you can see, the price is right. Use the offer code MACBREAK. You'll get 10% off. Yeah. 
And you'll let them know you heard about it on MacBreak Weekly. Squarespace.com. Free to try, but use the offer code MacBreak when you buy. Squarespace.com. Mr. Alex Lindsay. Oh, the Pi you, F and Dunn says the Pied Piper site is a Squarespace site. Let's see. Wouldn't that be interesting? You know, Pied Piper is this phony company that uh, was created uh, for the show Silicon Valley. It does look like a Squarespace site. Wouldn't that be funny? It does it looks a lot like a Squarespace site. That would crack me up. Hit escape on the site. What do you get if I hit escape? Uh, yep. That's it Squarespace is. It's Squarespace. <laughs> well, that's a pretty big endorsement. Yes, the guys at Silicon Valley use Squarespace for their startup. Chatterick. You nailed that one. Yeah. That is pretty cool. Well, that was F and Dunn said it, too. It, yeah. yeah, but you were the one who said hit escape. Of course, yeah. that's how you get, how you get to log in. in. Yeah. Oh, baby. Uh, Alex Lindsay, your pick of the week, sir. So I just got this app that, I, that I'm having a lot of fun with. Uh, have you seen Moju? No. So Moju is kind of like a Vine, a little like Vine. Um, M-O-J-U, and it's an iPhone app. And what you can do with it is, it's kind of, as I said, it's kind of like Vine, except instead of hitting play and watching some little short, you, you actually roll your camera back and forth. You're not going to see it on mine, but, but you, you move your camera back and forth, and as you move it, it goes through the series of frames. And so, um, you know, you can do little animations where when you move your, your camera, you, you kind of twist it back and forth. You can actually see things happening. You, can, you know, if you get creative, you can see things going in oh, and out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, That's neat. You get little, like, rotations around an object where if you do it in the right direction, which is the opposite direction than I would expect, um, it, it looks exactly like oh. you can you know, get kind of a panorama that's interactive. Um, there's something about it that's just a lot of fun. It's a little Instagram, little Vine, little, but there's something about it that I find more enjoyable than Vine for me anyway. Um, and uh, how you do you, I don't understand how it works. So you take a video and then the twist well, scrolls through the, is like a scrub like, through the like, video? Well, like Vine, you yeah yeah what yeah basically you're twisting the phone is scrubbing. actually scrubbing Got scrubbing the, the photo, and you can then you, you, in the same way you can take a still and then move it and a still and then move it and a still to create kind of a stop motion type of thing, or you can hold it down and just move your camera slowly you know around an object to give it a you know a, a rotational aspect to it. Um, it's just a fun little. That is fun nice. There's something. Not only is it fun, and you see a lot of the examples. I don't know why, but. I also just really enjoy the, the 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 sharing. I usually don't like the whole sharing process. I don't like I don't like the fact that you build applications around sharing. It makes me crazy. Um, you know, I just want to just do it and play with it and call it a day. Um, but there's something about it. Of, everyone's playing with it right now. All these little tests. And there's this like this little voyeurism. You're jumping into someone's world about what they thought was interesting to to shoot. And a lot of times it's their cup or it's whatever. But it's a it, it, from a social perspective i also find it very interesting so um you know it's free so it's really easy to go download and test if you're if you're interested but moju m-o-j-u i'm now see to answer your question that's what it would take to get me back to an iphone <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool but there's no it's and cool there is about. no uh, you i i'm almost positive that's you couldn't do that on android because that's using the apples well i don't know maybe you could do it on android i don't know i just don't know if it's available on android but it's, it's not but i but i'm wondering if they yeah yeah that might be something that needs the Apple hardware to do. Core motion. Awesome. Yeah. Good pick. Thank you, Alex. Mr. Renee Ritchie, your pick of the week. I have two. Uh, the first one is in honor of Alex, and I'll gladly defer to him if he knows much more about it than I do, but it's Teleprompt Plus 3. It's the new version of Teleprompt Plus. Sorry, Teleprompt Plus. It's a whole new app because Apple doesn't allow paid upgrades, and it's a very uh, big upgrade. Uh, I use it... Um, when we do pre-recorded video or segments where I need a large amount of text in front of me and I have to remember the details and I can't hold it all in my brain, but it's just the best teleprompter app I have found for the iPad to date. And it's a good update. And that's, and that's for the iPad. Yes. That's not what I we the use. the iPhone it. as well now. We use something else because we use it on a desktop, I guess. Yeah. On a desktop, I think we use prompter pro, which is a, that's kind of, everybody one. uses that. Yeah. But you know that's um and uh, but that's on the app store as well. But it's a lot more expensive too. It's right. hundred bucks or something like well, that. Well, it's professional. But um, but the Prompter Plus I think is is probably the best one on the iPad so far that I've seen. Cool. And the second one um, is the so Sonos controller. Um, it was not updated for a very long time, a very, very long time. It has been and now. They, they up, <laughs> yeah, they updated it for iOS 7 functionality early on, but it's finally been updated for iOS 7 design. It's beautiful. Um, 
They still stubbornly will not add AirPlay functionality, so I want to just keep complaining about that for as long as I possibly can. But the app <laughs> redesign is here. It's beautiful for anyone who well, you is. You know why they don't do AirPlay? Because they're selling hardware. Yeah, that's but, I mean, their it'd be business. So easy to AirPlay to their hardware. I mean, I would just love to be able to sit oh, there I and see. watch something on my iPad and have it come out. Because I have a Sonos home theater system, oh, so I, I have see what you're saying. the Play Bar, I have two Play Threes, mm -hmm. uh, and the Play Sub. And it sounds terrific for a for a wireless speaker system, but I can't airplay to it. But Another aside, thing they've done, if you have a surround like that, is now if you listen to music, you can use the surrounds as full stereo. So yes. that's really nice too, because they the were just app lying looks there. Great. I, it's so much prettier. It's yep. modern. Yeah, I mean, I saw the uh, press release this morning. Immediately downloaded it. Updated all my Sonos devices. I have like nine speaker systems. Nine. And now regions. our eyes are as happy as our ears. Yay. <laughs> That was going to be my pick, but you did a oh, good job. sorry, Leo. Well, it's a good one. Andy Anako, let's wrap it up with your pick of the week. Really cool, really fresh, or at least fresh to me game called Bleck, B-L-E-K. <laughs> and I, I'm afraid I can't, my mirroring does not work from this device to the screen, so I'm going to have to show, show it to you like this. Here's what happens. When you, like, stroke the screen, you're basically creating, like, a blob of ink that will then repeat whatever line you just did. And your goal is to get it to hit every one of these little dots. Oh, it's and another so, one of them. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so if you were just like stroke that way, it'll yeah. get through two, but that didn't get those two. Uh, so you have to figure out, I guess that if I go to like a multi hop thing. Oh, that's cool. Uh, maybe we'll start bouncing. And then on, uh, on, on higher levels, they introduce things like these black dots. Where if you fire, if your line hits one of these black dots, it simply disappears. So now I have to figure out how to make your little animated line bounce around and hit the dots while still avoiding that black dot. Mm. It really is something you have to play with in order to appreciate exactly how it works. But the game mechanics here is so are so cool, and it's almost meditative. See, oh, there you go. Yeah, almost hole. meditative, and on later on on, on later uh, levels. You find yourself trying to figure out, okay, was this, are they joking here? Is there any way whatsoever to actually clear this level? Uh, because there, there'll be more black dots and they'll be a little bit more complicated. And sometimes it's actually a lot simpler than you think it is. I just bought it like this morning and I've been like playing it like How all do you the spell time. Because I want it. B L E K. It's a two ninety. I think it's two ninety. I'm sorry. It's ninety nine cents on sale from its normal price. I think uh, for the next couple cents, of days yeah. or whatever. Oh, I'm buying it yeah. right now. Yeah. Again, I I love these. This is exactly the sort of game that's up my alley. I don't like I don't like these like games that take months and you know, hours and hours and hours to get through a long story or getting you to master different weapons techniques. I really like these th these ones you can dip into, spend a minute playing it, yeah. spend twenty minutes playing it, or intend yeah. to spend a minute playing, but then it's forty five minutes later and now you're late for your dinner date. Black, <laughs> I love it. Black, black, black. B L E K, and I'm downloading it right now. Hey, folks, that wraps it up for uh, Mac Break Weekly. You know what? For a day where there was very little Mac news, we had a lot to talk about. Should never worry about that. Thank you, Andy Anako, Chicago Sun-Times. Always a pleasure. Always a slice, Leo. Thank you. Catch Andy at 5x5.tv where Andy's uh, Anako's almanac is, but also he reads his old columns. Check. I put, I put on the cardigan, put the dog <laughs> by the fire, and we have a nice chat. <laughs> Remember, remember the Bernoulli cartridge? Well, this is my review of the new 40 well, megabyte Bernoulli cartridge. Well, that'd be actually fun to, to go back in A time stupid and... product. No one will ever have 40 megabytes, even with pictures <laughs> being up to 640 by 480 dots. <laughs> oh, what, how young and foolish we were back then. Right, Scraps? <laughs> That's right, Scraps. Thanks to Alex Lindsay for joining us all the way from the White House in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Actually, yeah, that's the I'm capital. Be, I, You're at the capital today. I am. I'm. 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 I'm in somewhere in D.C. Uh, so, the, but the uh, I'm gonna. Um, I'll be in Rwanda next week. So, uh, oh, wow. so I'll, I'll be coming in from there. We should. Uh, uh, should be good. So I'll be there. And then I think um, either Tanzania or Uganda the week after that. So we'll we'll figure out if we can uh, if I'm able to connect from those places. Um, we had a great class by the way uh, last week. Um, a, green, a green screen class. So if people want to check it out, um, they can just. Uh, Best thing to do is you can I go back to my Twitter feed because it's not very far up. I didn't tweet that much. Um, or you can just go to YouTube and just search for me and you'll you'll see the green screen class. Uh, it's a little experiment in interactive, you know, using the question system that we were using for this as well as 
the class in Rwanda, as well as a bunch of other, a lot of cameras in our studio. So if you want to see us experimenting with the next generation of what we plan to do for the Pixel Core, um, definitely check it out. You'll find me playing Black for the rest of my life. This is very <laughs> fun. Wow, I love this game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, oh, he, he, oh, rats. Uh, Mr. Renee Ritchie's at iMore.com. Thank you for being here, Renee. What else is up with you at iMore? Uh, I wasn't doing enough podcasts, so I just launched another one yesterday oh, with my, my good friend Dave Wiskus of the Unprofessional Fame. It's called The TV Show, and we talk about the previous week's television. Sounds great. What's not to Spoiler love? Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Do you talk about... Game of Thrones? We talked about Game of Thrones, Mad Men, uh, Arrow, Shield. Um, you know what I'm 24. currently becoming a fan of is this new show on uh, Showtime, Penny Dreadful. I've heard about it. I've not Ooh, tried it yet. you got to watch it. It's creepy. That was what my mom used to call the small books, the Penny Dreadfuls. Yeah. And, and so far they've got, I've only seen the first one, but the last one, last night was the second, or Sunday was the second one. But they've already got vampires and Frankenstein. So nice. it can only get better from here. Thank you all for being here. Mac Break Weekly is every Tuesday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC on Twit.tv. Download on demand, available at twit.tv slash MBW or iTunes or Stitcher or anywhere you use to aggregate your favorite internet programming, audio and video. In fact, if you subscribe, you're likely to get a better experience. You won't miss one, and that makes us happy and makes you happy. We also highly encourage you to check out the uh, fantastic Twit apps. They're not, none of them official, but there are a number of very good ones. We've got many developers out there now, and we love it uh, on, on every platform, including Roku and, of course, iPad and iPhone. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Now get back to work because break time. <laughs>